opportunity to uh, farm and have uh, micro farms, and then also to all the researchers. Right, so it wasn't like a huge budget, um, but a lot of it also came. It's, it's a big budget, but it got it got spread um, to be able to affect a lot of folks, and a lot of our um, uh, money and things came through in kind donations. So that allowed us to have our kitchen space donated for us for our original first three years, and now we've been able to pay that back for it and um, pay for it the, the the next three years also. So there's just a few of our partners involved. A um, little bit about our cooperative, right? So um, RGO, as I like to call us, right, is this to nourish people, nourish people, build connections, and improve our local com communities by growing opportunities for urban and small-scale farmers in the greater Mansfield area, and as I said, in Richmond County also. Um, we are farmer-owned. Um, we are made up of uh, eight new microfarm businesses. So um, a lot of people in our um, in our cooperative were not business owners before, and none of us previously um, had had really real farming experience on our own per se we had some growers and then um uh, and then um, none of us also uh, had any type of farm operation or anything established before we all formed a cooperative so we are we're a very very uh, interesting bunch of folks to uh, say the least and so right now um our cooperative of our eight folks we have uh, three farms that are located on the same site we'll talk about them NECIC and then grow forth urban farm uh, located less than a mile from us, we make up the four urban farmers, and then we have uh, four other rural farmers. Um, our cooperative is GAP, we're GAP certified and um, FISMA certified also. So uh, we did that, and I stressed that on our farmers, and that took a lot of work too. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a process for folks and things, especially when it's new, and you have to go through the audit, auditing and self auditing yourself and things and so on. But I really stress that so we could allow ourselves to work with uh, different buyers, right? Higher, higher value buyers and um, people who uh, you want to buy your uh, crops in a large volume, you want to be certified, right? You want to go to those folks and you want to let them know that, you know, you are um, practicing uh, good agricultural practices and that, you know, you, you've done that, you've done your paperwork and that you can make those um, uh, type of a demand, meet those type of demands. So this is a couple of us at the kitchen here. Um, and again, um, part of our initial establishment came with the help of IdeaWorks, who who gave us kitchen space for a couple of years as we got started, and really changed the uh, changed the uh, whole whole uh, approach to how we were going to be uh, successful by having the kitchen right up the street. So you know, it really helped us out. And well, just going through the process of talking about showing our guests. I'm sorry, Walt, did you want to have questions at the end or would you like to have questions as you speak? Um, I can uh, I can take the questions at the end. I was gonna make sure that's the time. Oh, okay, thanks. No problem. All right, and then um, this is just another picture showing us uh, just going through our labeling process. Uh, we do have a commercial spinner and things just going through the whole process of, uh, of cleaning and taking care of our vegetables. Um, um, if you guys in this uh, chat are thinking about forming a cooperative or even just as, your, as you guys are individual farmers right now, uh, please, please uh, work on your GAP certification and push your, uh, your co-op friends and farmer friends to do it also. And so just talking a little bit about um, our land and things too, I know um, a lot of this conversation was about like land, our land access. So in Mansfield, Ohio, on uh, residential plots um, and vacant lots uh, go for about 350 a, a plot. Um, nonprofits can get them as those $89. Um, our urban farm, which we're going to show you here, um, uh, was 12 acres. It was valued at 30K, right? It's We we are able to rent it from our uh, partners, Gorman Rupp, who, uh, who owns it for a dollar a year on a five-year lease. They're great partners, and uh, we look forward to extending that and continuing our work. And then um, we have to go through zoning, right? So you got, you got zoning issues, and not zoning issues, excuse me, zoning demands and requirements that we needed to meet which causes us to have to anchor our tunnels and just have to go through the process of making sure that we are following our city's demands. Um, we are, all, all of us urban farmers, we are 100% um, uh, raised beds, right? So we do have potential contaminated soil from being on the brownfield. And then our other urban farmer, um, she's on five vacant lots and those all had uh, buildings and structures on underneath them. And of course we deal with um, challenges as urban farmers and and things that uh, we still have to deal with animals, of course, uh, city water is a must, so you have to account for that with your bills and then in, in, in a higher weather. 
All right, so I just wanted to take a second to show to talk about um, one of our urban farmers, uh, Amanda Stanfield at Grow Fort Farm. Uh, this was a, a image outside of her house in 2017 in her backyard. Um, she's now since turned her uh, backyard into uh, where she farms for the cooperative. So out of, out of, all, out of all eight farmers, I kind of explain where everybody kind of farms, but she does have her farm right in her backyard, but she did have to combine five different city lots. And through working with the city and working with the cooperative, she was able to put her farm right um, in her own, on her own land. Um, if you can see right here on this side here, she was already doing a little growing and that turned into uh, now uh, this here. So this is a, just an aerial shot of her farm here, let me see, there we go. Aero shot of her farm here. Oh, she has two high tunnels on there, beds along the sides, beds in the back. You can kind of see how it's a, a, a tucked right into the community. Um, the street she's on, Fourth Street, is a very, very busy street in Mansfield. It's also uh, where our high school is located. You can kind of see in production here to location in the city. And this is her home uh, right here. So you can see those mounds that you saw in the picture before. And now uh, you can see her uh, tucked away oasis here uh, at Grove Ford Farm. That's a, a good shot too, just to show um, how tied we are in, into farming the community inside of her tunnels. It's really kind of cool. She has a front landscape too to catch the uh, to catch the running water so it wouldn't run into the street. Outside beds are really cool too. She's got some method. It's a method to the madness back there, but we're working with what she's working with what she has, and she's able to she's able to grow a lot of crops in this space and contribute to the co-op. And then now uh, moving on to the urban farm. So the urban farm is uh, owned by uh, NECIC. The land uh, is donated to us by Gorma Rupp. Uh, NECIC is the North End Community Improvement Collaborative. Um, they're a local nonprofit in Mansfield, Ohio. Um, and as I said before, it's uh, owned by Gorman Rupp. And you can see down here in the corner here how um, this is the land. This is how the land used to look. I don't know the exact date, but uh, this is kind of the original Gorman Rupp structure. And they kept improving and building on this building um, on the land that we currently farm on. All right, so this will look like what it was tore, tore down, the original Google Earth uh, photo when I first started working on the project. And then you can see uh, with the aerial how it is also tucked directly into our city. Here's Grove Forest Farm, Amanda's farm, as I was talking about uh, earlier, she's uh, less than a mile away. And then this is an uh, image of sort of what it looks like now. So when I got these aerial uh, photos done um, just a few months ago, we've actually added two additional structures um, on, the, on the site, right? So um, in order here, uh, one and two, and then one and two here, and then, uh, uh, seven and eight are ran by NECIC. We also have tunnel nine over here that you'll see in another picture here. And then the tunnel in the very, very back right here, that's the our cooperative, I mean, excuse me, our uh, composting tunnel that our cooperative can bring uh, things to and that we also um, put all of our vegetation and food scraps and things into. And then we also have a community composting program that People actually dump their food scraps. I mean, bring buckets to the farm, exchange them, and we dump their food scraps in the back also. Um, three and four right here are Vince's high tunnels, um, Vince Owens, he's fulfillment micro farms, and five and six in the back here are mine. So on this lot, uh, on this lot, NHT has allowed uh, me and Vince to uh, have um, ownership and establish our farms uh, at this site. Uh, Vince has now moved on now, and he has uh, a couple other locations he's going to be farming at, but he now leases this uh, spot from NECIC. And then currently right now, um, I am donating my uh, location to NECIC as I am helping the co-op with sales. So they are now uh, farming this area in the back. And I just did that for this year. So the last few years, I've been farming back here for the cooperative also. And there's some aerial shots just to kind of see, again, the connection to the farm in our community. And then this is a new uh, tunnel that you can see is right in front of tunnel eight right there. Um, this is Green Patch. So now me and Vince been on the location. NECIC has allowed a third business now to come on the site, on site and farm. And um, they will actually not be doing too much uh, actually growing vegetables, but actually doing plant starters and actually selling starters uh, to the community. 
and having a kind of retail outlet and tables and things around there and selling plants. And then they are also the company that helped us, helps us with our starters. So kind of bringing them in-house there. That's the, this is the additional tunnel, uh, Tunnel 9 now. This is also um, NECIC's tunnel. This was donated to us through uh, OSU's uh, Mansfield uh, Microfarm. It was the original microfarm that started our grant process and, um, and kind of pilot program that, um, that allowed us to be successful like we are now. So um, with, with, the, with the additional tunnels and the extra space that NECIC has, uh, NECIC looks forward to using it as a training opportunity also. All right, that's me and Vince in there. Showing you in, uh, inside of our tunnel. So Vince is also a vet too and registered as a veteran farmer. Um, so we've been able to present opportunities with that for him as well um, by him growing for uh, schools and him being a GAP certified farmer, of course, too. Let's look at the outside space a little. Back to the compost and tunnel. And then we just wanted to talk a little bit about land options opportunities, because um, I know a lot of this is about land access. As a cooperative, we work with small farms. So um, we've been able to uh, work with one of our farmers. She's only gonna be going just a couple crops for us. And that works for her. It's gonna work for her during the summer. We're gonna try to make her as much money as she is, as she, as she can. But um, she just uses a small bit of land. Now that's had to just do up a couple of uh, common uh, places that people are uh, kind of growing at nowadays that you can see and then think about some of the un uncommon ones, right? So business unused land, uh, unused land owned by the city, towns, uh, parking lots, right? Um, that's where our original micro farm project was on OSU's parking lot. They were able to produce a lot of crops out there. Um, parks, there's always containers, of course, if you don't have land access, uh, overlooked land. So unavailable, um, uh, unlivable houses. Um, uh, a, a friend of mine, he went to an auction and actually uh, won a, um, well, excuse me, um, the, he did not uh, need to even uh, even bid because nobody uh, wanted the place because of the house being torn down. But he wanted the property because of the land and not the house. So now he farms uh, a beautiful uh, a couple acre uh, piece of land that has a house that he doesn't even need to live in anyway. Um, so joint land opportunities, like I talked about um, with us in a, a on the nonprofit land, but that can be done on other folks' lands. And uh, of course, reach out to nonprofits. And then RGOs offering training. So, um, so one of the things you can think about too is just uh, uh, looking for uh, groups or organizations that want to involve people and get people farming together. Um, and just a few more photos too of our a cooperative, uh, some of our success here. Um, because of us all coming together, and, We've been able to uh, meet the demands and needs of gro some grocery stores, um, some some um, a few uh, CSA uh, large large CSA uh, buyers, and also some local restaurants, and of course a few other small buyers. We've been able to influence our high school. This is a mile high school uh, has now has a 144 foot tunnel that they're going to offer education in, and that the cooperative uh, the, through the cooperative been established in the work with NECIC. Now that they can farm um, at the middle school. Now there's a, a high tunnel at the middle school now also too, where they're growing food at. So they have that pipeline going from middle school to the high school, um, allowing kids to farm. Reach the people to school. Uh, we've been able to create an opportunity with our local prison to get those guys uh, out a few days a week and allowing them to uh, grow and help us at the farm. This has been a great partnership and now they're extending it and wanting us to come out and allow us to uh, farm at the actual prison. So we're working on a agreement with them and a partnership. And then our cooperative um, has, we have a farmer's market. The NECIC has a farmer's market uh, on the farm and our cooperative has a, has a booth there, right? So those giving us direct access to uh, getting our produce out to the community and having access to bringing the community to the actual farm. That's Vince there in the middle there again too and Amanda uh, from Grow Forth. And it's allowed us to do some partnerships um, with other uh, local local businesses. So this is us uh, with Yellowbird. So we partner with Yellowbird now to um, provide them with produce that they use in their CSA box, CSA style boxes. Um, and then they actually provide our community now with boxes too, and they include our produce, which is really cool. And then uh, just a little bit, I was just gonna talk about the political landscape of our, um, and then what we fight through with our cooperative of Mansfield. It's not a tremendously large city, 
Uh, it's only 46,000 uh, folks in there. And we do have to fight through zoning, which I talked about for the high tonus. I shouldn't say fight, but we just have to make sure we go through that process and recognizing that uh, where we are hitting up high tunnels and they have to be in uh, business areas. So the uh, areas that even are um, Amanda owns and then of course at the uh, urban farm, those are zoned um, business uh, locations. There's a huge lack of knowledge and understanding in our community. So as a cooperative, we're trying to fight through that. A lot of people think farming is only corn and soy. And then uh, and then uh, fighting for food justice uh, uh, movement that we are trying to tackle also. So we're trying to shorten a few mile, food miles, increasing the quality of food, uh, revitalizing vacant lots, increasing fresh food access, educating our community more, removing barriers to entry, and then um, um, composting, right? So that's going to save us money on the urban farm allowing us to use our own components, but then also making the community aware that we have a composting, a composting going on in the city and that you can bring your food scraps there too. And that's, um, that's a little bit uh, about our cooperative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walt. That, that is wonderful. I mean, obviously um, everybody in the chat is all excited, like, wow, you know, just um, a lot of comments. I don't know if you have the chat up, but there's a lot of comments. And then there's some questions too. Um, so oh, sure. um, this is a session where people can feel free to, to you know, unmute and ask your question directly to Walt. Greetings. Hello. Hey, so yeah, this is awesome. And I, I put like four questions in the chat. So I feel like... <laughs> I should like speak up and be like, yeah, that was me dropping all those questions in the chat. Um, so my name's Adama. And I'm Adama here. Yeah, so my first one, I'll just say it. The first one I said, is there a non-compete understanding with growing certain crops or selling to certain vendors like amongst the owners? Yeah, so that's a good question. You said a non-compete, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So in our in our co in our cooperative uh, agreement, um, it is set up that uh, farmers cannot sell to the same uh, folks that the cooperative is selling to. Um, and then I should have sorry, I, I was supposed to mention that, right? Um, the way our cooperative is set up in general to uh, be, to sell is that we actually tell our farmers what to grow. So um, we uh, we have relationships with different buyers, different folks, different local folks, and so on. And then uh, we come up with marketing agreements, and then we ask the cooperative me cooperative members to provide so so many uh, so much poundage of whatever crop per week for so many weeks. So we might ask for you know 900 pounds of tomatoes a week, um, 100 pounds of beans a week, um, you know uh, 50 pounds of broccoli a week, or whatever the case may be. And then that's what we agree to. And then everything outside of that, we just let the farmers be farmers, right? Um, grow food for themselves. They go to other um, other farmers markets outside of the one we have at the farm. Um, they sell food um, to their uh, just local friends or from their own, own uh, homes and things too. And um, and then also to some of their own their own private buyers and just people that they've established relationships with. Um, you know, well, we allow them to, of course, do that too. But on a larger scale, the cooperative tries to. Uh, sell the produce in a in a in a, uh, in a grander scale, and then there's a lot of smaller sales that the cooperative uh, farmers take on themselves. But yes, that's a good question. This this is Michelle, um, and I had a few questions as well. Number one, this is I applaud you, and um, I would like to know whether or not your group would be able to entertain our co-op here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I saw where you said at in one of your slides that you offer training. So we're we're a small, uh, we're called Seven Seed Sowers, and we just started up this past year. We're part of the Central State Incubator Extension Program. So we would love to. In fact, we're having our first retreat. So if you're available um, to zoom in, if you can come in person, that will be nice. But. I have two questions. You mentioned that first you got two point, was it $2 million through the FAR program? Yeah, it, was a million, it was a million from FAR actually, excuse me, it was a million from FAR, but then we had to match a million. So um, as a oh, community, we came a up with, yeah, we had, oh. we had to match a million. We, we came up with a half a million in cash and a half a million in kind, which also included uh, work and hours and commitment from all the cooperative members and, and so on too. Okay, so 
when you had, if you could, you don't have to, but if you could tell me the breakdown of what the majority of the monies went to, was it salaries or was it equipment or was it the high tunnels? What was the majority of that 2 million? And I'm glad you, you clarified that you had to match it. That's, that's awesome. Yes, yes. So, um, so well, half a million um, um, came from just in kind work, work and things too. So, um, that was uh, just different services and things that people provided to us to help train us, and then um, the kitchen membership and um, and there was other other just type of services in, in there. Um, a lot of money went to the researchers. Uh, we had to buy the researchers out and buy their time out uh, over the course oh, of three okay. years. So this was a three year grant too. So um, over the course of three years, we had to buy out their time. And then um, we did um, a lot of money went to uh, infrastructure to be able to provide kits. So there were 10 original members and there. We had 10 uh, kit style kits um, to be able to uh, provide for the farmers. And that came um, with the high tunnels. It came with um, uh, irrigation, uh, soil and wood and things for the urban farmers. And then a few other uh, gizmos and gadgets and things to help us get established. But there were a ton of things that we needed to buy, um, buy um, also. And then um, it came that also, we also had to pay for a lot of um, our training uh, to buy out some of our trainers times and the people that worked with us. Um, we were literally a group of people who had no farming background. Um, my, my, me, myself personally, um, I had volunteered at the farm and grew um, a little small, you know, um, four foot three by, you know, four foot or so um, <laughs> vegetable bed for the local animals. You know, that's all, all the growing that I had. All the growing experience that I had previously, so um, there was a whole like process at all um, to, to it all that uh, that um, that they had uh, that they kind of walked us through, and of course there was money to purchase seeds and um, all those type of things too, and to really kind of keep us alive uh, for a few years. But we did structure things in a way that um, literally, if we wouldn't have got this grant, then we would have uh, still formed a cooperative. So um, even at the time that um, before we even we did it, before we even knew. That, um, before we knew the results, we, we had already been through the whole process of um, establishing ourselves and we were going to do something that summer anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank no you. Uh, are you still open if we, if you uh, drop oh, Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes, we would yes, love we, for you to come see us. Yes, Yes, please. and we do, we do, we do help uh, other cooperatives. We actually help uh, help in another cooperative form in Marion. Okay. Um, right now, uh, even too, so. And my last question, I don't want to hog up everything. Uh, urban uh, farming, the security, have there been any issues around security? If you could address that and I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, where that site is that there's a, a natural barbed wire fence that we inherited there. And then they put another fence on the, um, on the backside that separated uh, the actual, um, they still have a, a site that they do use that wasn't torn down in the back. Um, and then they're good neighbors uh, too. So. Um, the way it's kind of fenced off, uh, it doesn't look super attractive to be in there and it does sit off the road, but it is something that we thought about and we have always, um, you know, kind of been on the lookout for, but I'm um, very grateful that we haven't had uh, any issues um, at the farm. So we're grateful for that. Hi, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm new to farming. So could you uh, just explain like what the certification was that you listed and how you go about getting that certification? Yeah, so we talked about the good agricultural practices, the GAP certification. Um, we got in uh, contact, uh, you guys reach out to them, uh, Quality Fresh, right? Tell them the Richland Grow Up sent you, sent you guys there. Um, they will come out and do an audit um, on the farm for 500 bucks. If you guys, if you guys, if it's a group of you guys or collectively multiple folks that you know in your area or around that will be willing to go through the audit, um, they charge us 300 bucks a farm. So we are able to do groups of four for 300 bucks a piece and then another group of four of us for 300 bucks a piece to get everybody certified and then what they will do is too they'll uh, send you a copy of the actual audit um, so you can walk through the audit give, us, give yourself your uh, audit before they come out and make sure that you are preparing yourself and then we used um, a lot of osu's um, um, information so if you go to osu extension and you uh, look up like a gap uh, or like gap certification um, there's tons of templates and guides I literally went through there step by step by step through uh, OSU's templates and guides and um, and took and matched that with the actual um, audit and um, hand in hand and then uh, was able to pass the first time with um, a 93 and then um, 
And then I even corrected everything for one of our buyers that they needed 100%. So I corrected everything from the 93 to give us 100%. Um, so it's a little bit of a process, but uh, again, uh, Quality Fresh um, is the uh, is the folks to uh, to call, and they can help you. Uh, great guys, they'll walk you through the process too. It's a lot cheaper than uh, calling in a USDA agent or somebody. That that'll cost you about fifteen hundred or so, depending on how big your site is. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one more question: How did you find like the people that you wanted to be in the co-op with you, or did they reach out to you? Well, yeah, it was um, it was really kind of it was crazy because you know we didn't get to put a lot of buzz out there, but um, um that came through uh, connecting with the NECIC. So uh, me, Vince, and Amanda, um, and Tim had all had uh, indirect connections to the NECIC. Tim worked for the Farm Bureau, um, and then um, you know, a few of us just kind of uh, was just through making connections and just kind of putting the word out there. And there was a summit, so there was a a really nice summit, and um, I stayed a part of the whole process throughout the summit. Uh, for the people who were interested and then um and, and then it became a reality so we just kept working on it a lot of people fell off when you had to start doing the work right so um so uh, a lot of people that stayed in, in tune with everything throughout doing the work and then not every and also we have people that are around us and help us that support us um that just aren't cooperative members too so we're very grateful for them too okay thank you no problem if we still got time, I, I did have a, a few questions and they might kind of all go together. So just answer what you can. First yeah. one is how are the profits slash expenses split amongst owners? Um, was there a minimum investment amount that co-owners were expected to invest up front? And then when owners transition out, did they receive any type of financial equity? Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so the profits and expenses are split up. Uh, we started out on a 60, 40 split while we were in training and then now we're on a 70, 30. So the uh, cooperative uh, does take 30% of, um, of all the sales, you know, the way we are set up, um, it's pretty much you grow. And I mean, that is what, that's the way we set things up for our farmers. We want them to grow the best crops possible, pit the refrigerator and the rest is on the cooperative to take care of it. So if it needs to be broken down into smaller quantities, who it goes to, everything else, um, you don't worry about that. You drop your produce off by Sunday and then um, we on, we're on about 45 days and then you get paid uh, every about 45 days um, for uh, your crops for the month and a half uh, before. Pretty much 30 though, but we say 45 though. So we're on about 30, but we have to wait for um, our buyers to uh, pay. Of course, I mean, uh, of course. So we just we just try to say about forty five days, and then as far as investment, the initial investment was a lot of time, right? So part of that in kind match was um, actually pitting, you know, showing up, so so doing a lot of training, um, hosting different things, uh, actually going out helping each other, um, and then there was an initial sheet that was um, formed to show us like what we were going to have to pay for, what we still needed as farmers, uh, so we can expect, so we knew what to expect and and what we had to come up with. Um, as individuals before everything even started. And a lot of that, those expenses were just formed around what we needed to uh, farm. And actually, as far as being being in the cooperative, it was initial $500 uh, membership that the cooperative came up with um, and that they're looking to uh, now starting to move into maybe some type of annual $500 or so. Now that we're out of the training process and we are actually a uh, step in, now we're out of the, excuse me, the grant process and we are actually, um, um, on our own now um, and, and getting ready to complete our first year. And then the last question that you had there, um, it was the transition of ownership when somebody's out. So with the cooperative, um, you get what you put in. So um, everybody that completed the grant process and the grant program and things, the, they own their equipment, they own their high tunnels, they own uh, what was given to them. Uh, we did have to go through a period where towards the end there, going into the third year, where some people struggled and didn't meet their requirements. So some people did have some uh, some tunnels um, transferred and, um, and some kind of uh, downsizing. Uh, we didn't want people keeping tunnels that weren't using them and uh, weren't growing things for the cooperative. And, um, and so there were some adjustments there, but as far as when you leave the cooperative and things, um, you can only um, leave, you can only get what you put in, uh, but there's no initial like a buyout or any money um, if you decide to, um, um, to resign. Well, thank you, question. that was awesome. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know if I missed the, the initial buy-in because I know we, we decided to do dues and everything 
And are you considered a uh, nonprofit or both profit and not? Do you have a nonprofit component of of your co-op? Um, though our, our co-op is, uh, is set up as a for-profit co-op. Um, the NECIC, of course, is a nonprofit. Their farming arm is a social enterprise, and everybody else in the cooperative is all for-profit. So when it comes to doing grants or it comes to um, saving money on something or you know uh, the whole incubation and things, we count on the NECIC, and um, the cooperative is a partner of the NECIC um, also, too. So, so that's how we kind of fit fit into the nonprofit side of things, but just through our partnership. So did you you partner with them so that you could have an arm for nonprofit? Is that correct? Are you yeah, under, yeah, it, under them? Yeah, exactly. So the so the NECIC is actually a member of the Richland Grow Up. It, it, they're one of the eight. So oh, um, it okay, allows us. Exactly. Yeah, so it allows us to uh, have that kind of joint connection um, uh, because the the nonprofit can. Um, can um, uh, help apply for or or, or treat the uh, RGO as a part of their business. This is awesome. I can't wait to meet you. Yeah, so you guys, if anybody wants to come down, you could definitely, uh, we can definitely set up a visit and things too. Um, so yeah, you know, that would be awesome, awesome. Would you be open to uh, sharing like your email or just the website so we can contact you later if we have any questions? Yep, I just threw that in okay, the uh, chat you. there too. Yep. NCIC website and then uh, send it off. Are there any more questions? We still have a few minutes. So we I have, have a question. Go ahead, Ebony. Um, does anybody live on the land that y'all have for the co-ops? Yeah, you know what? Um, our rural farmers, uh, three of our, so our urban farmer, um, you know, her farmers right there, three, excuse me, two of our rural farmers, their farms are directly, um, 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 on, on their land near their house. Our other two rural farmers, uh, Judith, uh, she has a, a, she bought a piece of land that she wants to try to turn into kind of a vent space too. Her, her farmer's there. And then our other farmer, she actually has her farm on a farmer's land, right? So, uh, so, some, so we do have a few folks that have their farms on their land and everybody else kind of has that, uh, kind of has to go to their farm, which is, uh, which, you know, which, which actually, you know, for me and Vince was, you know, the way to go. We wouldn't have been able to uh, farm without, you know, having the NECIC give us, give, give us that type of access to uh, be on their land to farm. But I wish they would let me put a trailer on the urban farm. It's big enough out there, I tell you. <laughs> I asked about it, I joke around about it and things, but, um, yeah, I have an RV, so I'm like, if if y'all could live on the land, that would be awesome because you could just park there and then just work every day. Yeah, yeah. Is it so a donation? Few of the guys that, that work, you say what now? I was just asking if it's a zoning issue. Is that why they are not allowing it? Uh, you know what? It's just the um, the the partnership that we have with with Gorman Rupp, Most importantly, um, says that you know the land would be used for like farming only and things. Um, do we do have another side that we call it the six street side so you can kind of see we're farming on that sliver in that picture. Um, there is a whole uh, piece of the land that's been unused that I um, am trying to make it uh, presentable for some type of partnership or joint uh, joint uh, venture that can kind of conjoin with the farm or tie in the community. And there's been talks of uh, pinning tiny houses or small homes on that side of the property, which I think would be which would be really cool too. Walt, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, middle school and the education. Um, did you have to go through the city of Mansfield's um, Board of Education to co-op or to collaborate with the school or you did it directly with the principals and teachers of that school? And um, have, have you set up a 4-H program for that elementary as well with the co-op? 
Yeah, the, so the, the elementary, um, I mean, the school, uh, senior high is our um, attached to a 4-H uh, program. So that was kind of already going on, but not to the capacity of uh, what, we, what we think it could. So we did try to help push for a greater, uh, you know, 4-H presence there. And as far as the partnership, yes, we did. Yep, well, I presented to the school board. Um, I got with the superintendent. I got with all the principals. Um, that is my former middle school and my former high school. So, you know, it's very uh, important to me to be able to, to try to make it work. I also got with some uh, with some educators and um, some folks to try to create the education component uh, and partnership behind it. So the kids are getting college credit and things um, as they go through a program at the high school. And so it took a it took a bunch of folks getting all together, some meetings coming all together. And, um, and I have been at it for a, a while. So so this is we're going into our fourth year. The high school just got their high tunnel a few months ago in, a, in, in the middle school last year. So when this project initially even started and it was in its grant phases and things, you know, I have, I've been beating down doors to try to kind of start the process and the conversation and the talk about what it would look like to um, bring agriculture to uh, our high school, which we which we don't have. We have, we have it around our um, around the uh, other areas of Richmond County, but there is no agricultural presence in our school system. And so, um, so it did take a little bit of a, a process and I did get everybody together multiple times to make it happen. That's awesome. That is, that's awesome. But then my last question was, how did you get Ohio State to give you a free donated? That's what I want to oh. know. How they, <laughs> they donated? I was like, how do we well, get the state to donate some to us? Okay. <laughs> well, a lot of it came through the, uh, the partnership with NECIC, right? So um, with them not supporting the, the program, the pilot program, you know, was over, you know, they, they ran, it ran its course. OSU was not going to financially support a person uh, being out there farming and taking care of it on that campus. Um, that campus is, was, uh, for lack of better words, you know, that that wasn't a focus on that campus. It was an experiment and a pilot project. And so that they um, they had to uh, this, this um, they had to, they had to, uh, you know, get rid of everything. And uh, they couldn't throw it away, of course, or anything like that. They had to donate it. And so it just so happened that NECIC had been such a strong partner of Ohio State Mansfield, and, um, and they donated all the stuff to us. So yeah, it came, a lot of it came through the partnership that we have and, um, and some of those initial conversations and, and, um, and ties um, with OSU Mansfield through building this project over the last, uh, four, going into the fourth year, fifth year now. Well, I just want to say I'm very proud of you and your you, co-op. You. Hey, well, I had I have one more question. I said, um, is there any thought about purchasing the land from the corporation that owns it? And if not, is there a contingency should the corporation want its land back? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question, also too. Um, I I built in a um, I built in a clause <laughs> with, that uh, we would approach them um, a year and a half before the lease is up, which was this year uh, going into this year. And uh, we have approached them um, already, um, but we haven't done an ask or anything. There's a larger capital campaign that's going on with the NECIC right now. They're uh, trying to raise about 12 to 14 million dollars. If you guys know any major donors, um, to build a community center and um, a, a community center, just a whole kind of um, um, a mission and, and a st staple in our in our community and things. And um, and so there's like a greater partnership and things that we're looking. Uh, looking forward with them and then also looking into like sponsorship opportunities and kind of where we're trying to see where Gorman Rupp might want to take this because it really has become a big deal in our community now over the last few years and so um, we're looking to kind of go beyond asking for the land and asking for um, you know a really true partnership and sponsorship get some dollars rolling in every year that can help continue to support that farm that's very expensive venture um, also too I would not try to act like it's not. I mean, I, I do consult for the NECIC over everything farming. And so um, I'm directly in there, you know, as part of, you know, the whole process of it all, but the impact that we're able to make and um, and what in the value that we're able to bring uh, does make it very attractive for um, um, a company like Gorman Rupp to, um, to continue to want to work with us and help sponsor us and sponsor our market and the other activities and things that we do out there. So yeah, so long story short, yes, we are definitely going to ax, but it's going to be a greater ax than just for the land. Yeah. Always think partnerships, guys. Like always, even with the buyers, and I, I uh, contract to sell for the cooperative too. That's why I'm not growing. So this is my first year not growing since the program started. But um, you know, I don't think about sales. I don't think about just uh, getting people to you know give us a couple of bucks. I, I think really long term. Like how can I help them meet their goals? How can we form partnerships? 
I don't, I don't want buyers. I want partners. And, um, and so on, we don't want, we want donors, you know, we want sponsors and partners and things like that. Um, let me, let me jump in. Um, so I did my training, um, down on a farm, an urban farm, my first training, I've done a lot of training in farming, but my first training was down in Atlanta on an urban farm. And that land was owned by a church and it was across the street from the King Center. And sure enough, um, as land value, you know, began to rise and the city really wanted to develop that area, um, you know, they did not renew that lease and the uh, farm had to move. And they did. They picked up the, the land, the, the um, not the in ground, but the soil, the com <laughs> like they literally like moved the beds and everything. Right. Feel me. Yeah. Um, but I asked that question specifically around ownership because of the concern for, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, let's say Google wanted to settle down in Manning and, you know, they approached Northrum, you know, and was like, hey, that land right there, can we get it for? And then all of a sudden, is it like, well, this has been a good run, farms, <laughs> yeah. but a run, yeah. you know, so that's why I was asking. No, no, you are, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the lady that uh, helped our cooperative initially, a lot of funding went to her and her training to help us. Um, she she only got made available because she got kicked off of a food bank property that they had been on, you know, for years and years and years. Um, so yes, I, I you really do sound like me. I've been I've been hollering about this <laughs> in meetings and different things to make sure that you know we've uh, you know we we done a lot. Of, um, we we established water lines. We used to truck water in and pump it um, through uh, lines to to water that thing initially. So we've done a lot with the water, electricity, um, cement pads, you know, um, different, a few little structures, additional high tunnels, so a few extra businesses on it. And um, what we've really done is uh, try to continue to, to uh, it's a lot, a lot of it is moved in good faith right now. And, um, and a lot of that, it has been working out. And so that's what's kind of got us in position now to kind of look at a bigger opportunity and a bigger acts. But I think you are absolutely right. I would caution uh, all you, everybody to um, go above and beyond making sure that you secure your land um, um especially so much you know riding on on you on to such so much riding on the success of you guys as businesses individually but um but one of the things also that we've done too is we've done a lot of this you know in different things and uh, uh um hand in hand with Gorman Rupp and uh and making sure we include them in certain things and making sure they're you know they're they've been acknowledged for certain things and so it really has we really have been trying to build it up in good faith to to do something uh, uh bigger with them and then I'll know I'll know here in about you know, less than a year or so, um, you know, what's going to be next for us. But but that is a very good comment. Yeah, six, seven figure partnership. That's right, for sure. We still have about 15 minutes. So if anybody has any other questions or comments they want to make, please feel free. Um, in order to get like your grants and stuff, how did you all go about writing a business plan just for um, just to like do multiple grants and stuff? Just yeah, for like people that don't have um, like the capital to start right away. Yeah, a lot of things that we do, a lot, um, a lot of what we do is um, we try to figure out like what we're trying to like accomplish and uh, and what our needs are. And then we try to formulate, um, you know, a lot of information around around those areas. And then we look for the grants and things that uh, that work for us. Um, and you know, that's kind of the way that you know our kind of uh, our process uh, through it is just kind of you know really just establishing you know what you're looking for, uh, what we want, what we want to try to accomplish. For example, like we were trying to get uh, the wood for our outside beds. So when we started originally, we didn't have outside beds. Um, so you know, we knew that was something that we wanted to do. And so on, and then we started trying to figure out, you know, what grants would work for something like that. Uh, how how we could apply it to um, um, tie in, uh, you know, the learning aspect of it, why we needed them, the importance of having them, you know, and those type of things. And uh, and for those that are new to grants and things, like I was new to grants before this whole process, and now I've been a part of and written and um, have gotten some denial letters and been successful. Um, um, quite a few grants now. I think a lot of it is. Uh, you got to treat them like really big research projects. 
So um, the biggest thing is, you know, knowing your problem, knowing what you're trying to solve, and then trying to build um, everything else around it. And so going and knock on the doors and finding the folks that you need to collaborate with, excuse me. And even if that, even if, if even if that's on the um, the writing side of things or handling the grant, and just figuring out what you can contribute to and what you can help and how you can help uh, uh, make it happen. I mean, I really can't say enough about you know collaborations. That's the only reason why our cooperative is uh, as successful as it is now. It's through us reaching out and um, asking a bunch of folks for help. So in grant process, you know, definitely do the same thing. Okay, thank you. I noticed that you um, you've been mentioning grants versus um, who we our speakers earlier, which was USDA and some other and credit unions and everything else. So um, as a young co-op, we're looking at grants, but and I guess my question will be: Are any of these? Because uh, we felt like grants, you don't have to pay back; you just have to perform. Mm -hmm. So have you all? Um, um, solicited any of the um, the speakers like we had earlier, like USDA credit unions or anything else to fund um, your co-op and your collaboration? Yeah, you know yeah I'm very glad you said that because I, I, I forgot to mention um, when I was rolling through the slides, right? So Green Patch, that, that company, that's that third company that's coming on the farm now um, and uh, with, that's growing the, uh, the starters, they uh, applied for a USDA grant. So um, um, Dan, Daniel Sneef himself, he was able to get a USDA grant um, to help him purchase, I mean, excuse me, a USDA loan to help him uh, purchase uh, his, uh, his greenhouse. And so, um, and then also too, we have worked with the USDA office because we were gonna apply for additional tunnel to equip um, um, right, uh, right when COVID was going on. And, um, and, uh, and we went through the actual process of getting registered as a farm to uh, working with the USDA. So before you can apply for um, any of those type of things, you actually have to count, right? You need to uh, apply and register your farm as a farm. So if anybody hasn't done that yet, so it's not a difficult process at all. Uh, you just gotta get with your USDA, local USDA agent, and they'll come out to the farm and, you know, and so on, and some paperwork involved. And then you actually get registered, then you get a USDA farm number, which, uh, which again, uh, count, counts you officially for sure. And then that would allow you to apply for um, some of their different services and also some of, uh, some of the different opportunities. Sharon, did you wanna so, come off of, I'm sorry. Um, Sharon, did you wanna, thank you for that uh, answer. Walt, did you wanna come off of uh, mute Sharon and ask your question? Oh, I, would, oh, so I was I just interested in the, 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 kit. the kits. Yeah, so the kits um, that you were mentioning, how were they put together or who decide what was going to go in that? Yeah, so through the process of the grant, I know it sounds like a lot of money and things, but we did not have enough money to um, to build, build the structures and tunnels and things in a way that we um, initially wanted to in for enough folks. Um, so um, I actually got awarded the, um, I actually got awarded the contract to uh, build, a, build the high tunnels also. So um, I initially built 22 tunnels and then through the other partnerships and everything, I built the high schools uh, in, in partnership with, uh, with Yoders, but I've been um, a part of uh, getting the high schools built and also uh, the ones in Marion. So the initial ones in the initial project, um, my company and Yoders, uh, Yoders built together and our products were uh, purchased through Yoders. So that was an opportunity that was really nice. I did not see that coming at all, but um, with my background and things, I had already been preparing and looking at a lot of this as the grant and things were happening and going on. And I told him, I was like, you know, I told him that, you know, it's gonna be hard for you guys to do that. And I was worried about the financial means of it. And I had already kind of tried to solve it for the cooperative. And so through me trying to solve it for the cooperative it allowed me actually just to take on the contract and just to do it. So um, I was out there building high tunnels in COVID and, and when you had to, you know, have your paperwork to be on the road and all that, the whole process. But uh, but I would recommend Yoders. So you know, you guys definitely go with Yoders, Yoders Produce. Um, you know, let them know that you you know heard from the Rich Negro Up and things. Uh, Roman is the guy to talk to there. And I would I would I would try to tell you guys to um, do any type of high tunnel purchases or anything through Yoder Produce. So did Yoders um, did they train you, or you already have a background in contracting? 
because no, I've been no. up to Yelder's. So I was like, did yeah, they? Yeah, no, I, uh, no, just, it was just really just um, well, part of, part of my premises of my company, the food lab is to build, grow, feed. So, um, so I go from seed to stomach, I do some catering, I do some growing, and then um, I don't only physically uh, work on building farms and things, but also just building the, the, the uh, actual structures around, you know, and creating farming opportunities and things too. So it's already part of my goals and part of my business structure to um, help build and help, uh, help farmers uh, build and things and so on. So it's just something that I kind of took on, took on. I did not have the high tunnel experience and uh, the, I had the high tunnel growing experience, but I did, um, but I, I was, um, I was handy enough and, um, and able to create the partnership to, uh, to be able to get it done with, uh, with Yoders. So, you know, once you kind of got them, once I, you know, I, um, I was able to uh, really get a feel for them. I went out and saw a few of their builds and things where some people had uh, uh, Yoders high tunnels at, and then um, just kind of got a, got a team together and kind of went through what what we need to do and uh, and partner with them and then we just knocked them off. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been up to Yoders a couple of times. So yeah, it's, it's cool an interesting place. place. Yes, it is. Yeah. Any other questions, yeah, comments? You guys have been great. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, one quick question. This is a general one, but it's always good. If you could go back in time to like correct a mistake, what would you do? Oh man, oh gosh. Uh, I, I would have definitely um, from the start of it all, when we were doing our partnerships and figuring out you know, how to do this, where we're gonna do it, who we're gonna do it with all that stuff, we should have got the buyers included. <laughs> that was something that we, you know, we thought about, we kind of thought of it differently. We wanted to try to go for uh, larger institution sales originally, and who would have thought COVID was gonna happen? Who would have thought all these things were gonna happen, right? And then even then, so um, larger institutions don't like to pay, you know, top dollar for stuff, right? Um, so, you know, there's a kind of a, a hope that, you know, you kind of have hopes that people will buy stuff from you because you're small and you're local and you're doing the right things and you're, you know, you grow stuff organically and so on, but at, uh, there's still a bottom line to it all, right, for uh, businesses to be successful. So uh, I definitely would have went back and made sure that we had some really, really strong partnerships uh, before we even put one high tunnel in the ground um, that was that were going to buy our produce, and I recommend and stress that to all you growers. Um, there's a passion, you know, for all you guys to even be on this call, of course, to, 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 to grow and to get into food. But if you don't know where your produce is going and it doesn't make financial sense, you know, there's no point in you trying to get a loan or you won't be able to pay it back, you know, or even being out there in, in such a large capacity. Um, that's the difference between gardening and farming. You know, that is the biggest difference. So, um, you know, farming, you need to be you're growing food and providing food for others in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of a sales and, and business and things versus gardening, you can have a two acre garden. And if you're not selling produce or you're not uh, in it to, uh, for a financial gain and things, then, um, then you're gardening. Yes, you're, you're gardening or you're growing because some people yeah, do not- uh... Oh yeah, you're growing, you're just a grower, you're being a grower. You know, yeah. and that's, that was one of one of the biggest things to kind of help, you know, separate a lot of our cooperative members and figuring out the capacity of what people could really do. And there's nothing wrong with being a grower. There's nothing wrong with gardening. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a passion for this and things. But when it comes to farming, you, you need to know where it's going. You know, you got to sell produce. You got to keep your farm lights on. As I, as I like to tell, you know, our farmers all the time, we got to keep our farm lights on. So that's why I try to create these bigger partnerships with folks that we can, you know, get rid of our vegetables as soon as they come to the refrigerator. So that's what I would definitely go back and change. And I would really stress that to you guys as you guys go in your growing adventures. If you are going to move into the farming fields, uh, have your buyers lined up. Good advice. Very good advice. So do you have any um, parting words? We have about three minutes or so left. And if you want to just give us some parting words of wisdom, then we'd appreciate it. Um, no, I mean, this is great. Like, I, uh, you know, I'm very grateful, um, Tia, that you uh, invited me to, to, to be able to speak. Um, I don't know if you spoke to them, but I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Tia at the, um, 
at the at the at the house at the state house in uh, in Columbus um, with uh, Ms. Paula Hicks Huxton and, and their approach to try to um, she was uh, focusing on um, online access and allowing people to uh, to grow food and trying to tie it in with the school and education and things too. And so um, it's just really good to be able to see people out here um, that care and that are trying to do this work, you know, and, uh, and people um, of color and beyond uh, trying to all come together to, uh, to, to grow vegetables and things. And, uh, you know, and just a few years ago, I mean, this all just happened. Like we got that grant in 2019. We didn't get our first high tunnel on the ground until May 2019. So, you know, this is all, you know, relatively really, really new for me really really still new for us so you know i just challenge you guys to stay focused and um and to stay at it you know and, uh, and, and make it happen for the greater good of a uh, farming in ohio and beyond too so so no i appreciate you guys and that's really all i have to you awesome thank you so much for the encouraging um words walt we really appreciate it your presentation was awesome very encouraging very um just I'm sure everybody's leaving here with their wheels turning and thinking, you know, about some of the stuff that you have uh, have uh, presented to us today. Uh, Miss Michelle, uh, Walt is in Mansfield, Ohio. He's in the Mansfield, Ohio area. She's wondering, wondering if you were in Atlanta oh, or Ohio. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you talking to someone else? Yes, and I and I thought I had switched out because I used to live. Uh, my home is in Atlanta, so okay, I was okay. trying. To Conversate with her, but okay, you're gotcha. in Columbus, Walt, right? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, in Mansfield, Ohio. I'm an hour from Columbus, hour from Cleveland. I'm 71. Oh, so, um, oh, you up that so, way? Okay, okay. Yep, yeah, yeah, so very, very easy to get to. Okay. All right. Thank you again, Walt. We really appreciate you coming, and we are no going problem. to go ahead and return to the main room now. And thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you guys. Reach out. Appreciate it.